Oh, great. We've got people joining already. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Very good. Hello, hello. Hi, if you're joining us, um, please let us know if you can hear me okay in the, um, I think it's the chat box. That would be amazing. And let us know where you're joining us from today. Thank you, John and Arvind, excellent. Okay, thank you, Pamela. Hey, hi, Lola from London, Chicago, Illinois, Nashville, Tennessee. Hey. <laughs> Excellent. New York City, wonderful. Oh, great. Thank you guys for joining us today. I'd also really be grateful if you could let me know uh, in the chat box if you are members of A Small World or if you're joining us from LinkedIn. Hi, Natalie, thank you, and Daphne and Tara. ASW, LinkedIn, hi, Tara. Wonderful, Elizabeth, welcome, welcome back. Arvind, LW. Oh, wonderful, so it's a nice mix. Oh, got one from Facebook as well, LinkedIn. Oh, amazing, welcome everyone. Good, well, before I hand you over to AJ, uh, I just wanted to make you guys aware, for those who used to be members, for people who are members and may not know yet, and for people who don't know anything about A Small World, um, A Small World is the, um, the world's leading lifestyle and travel community. And um, basically, it's a platform where you can meet like-minded people who enjoy the good life. And the good life, well, that that's exactly what it means for every individual. If you enjoy traveling, if you enjoy, um, you know, frequenting uh, bars and, and events and experiences around the world, um, then a small world would be a great place for you to connect with other people who enjoy the same things. Um, now, historically, we have only really on the website had, um, well, our members meet in, in a uh, in at our events on um, in person and also online but historically we've only had the kind of discussions panel and direct messaging as a way for our members to interact with each other and earlier this week we launched something completely new which we actually should have launched a long time ago um, but we launched uh, member posts earlier this week so it kind of is a hybrid uh, between Facebook and Instagram in the sense that you can um, post your pictures for example of your holidays um, or, or events um, you post your pictures and then you can either share it with the entire community or you can share it with only your own connections and what makes this such a unique opportunity is very much like Instagram and Facebook from many many years ago it was the early adopters that jumped on board and made the most of that platform learn how to use it inside and out and then leverage that to build their own brands and that's where we are today hashtag influencer culture so I thought that tied in really really nicely with AJ's um, talk today which is all about building a, a influential personal brand and hopefully as you listen to her you'll discover that with a small world launching this new um, member post feature it presents a unique opportunity in the sense that it's an existing platform but a new opportunity for people to reach new audiences exactly exactly maria it's been around forever i think it launched the same time as facebook and instagram way back when but um, it was very much a closed community and now we're slowly but surely opening up um, and, uh, and reaching new, newer audiences. So as I mentioned before, it's a new uh, opportunity for people to reach um, new like-minded people. And so if you wanna try it out, um, you would need to download the app um, or at least the latest version of the app. Um, and it is, uh, I think it's asw.com forward slash iOS for people who use Apple um, devices. And then there is, uh, the Android version, uh, which you can also download from asw.com forward slash 
Android. So we'll put the links in the discussion box for you anyway, just in case you wanted to try it out. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it from me. And um, I'm going to pass you on to AJ now, just a little bit about her. She's the co-founder co of Brand Builders Group with, and an international speaker, a million dollar consultant and host of her own influential personal brand podcast. So she's joining us from Nashville, Tennessee today. And I think it's around 1 p.m. or just after 1 p.m. over there. So thank you very much for joining us today, AJ. And um, yeah, enjoy the webinar, everyone. Yes, and it's so amazing to see so many names uh, pop up from uh, really all around the world. So uh, super excited to be here. And uh, I have some really actually exciting uh, data to share with you guys. Uh, my company, I'm the CEO of Brand Builders Group. I'm a co-founder along with my uh, husband and New York Times bestselling author, Rory Vaden. And we have been kind of on this mission <laughs> for the last three years. Um, since the inception of our most recent company, Brain Builders Group, to figure out what makes an influential personal brand. And so our, our company, we are a personal brand strategy firm for entrepreneurs, executives, influencers, small business owners, uh, but anyone who was looking to make more money and more impact. And a question that we get asked all the time from people of all walks of life is, well, what is a personal brand? Like, what is a brand? And I think in, in some regards, uh, this is still a, a new topic for most people, for the wide population. This concept of personal branding is still relatively new when you think about traditional marketing. And so we set out almost an entire year ago um, to do a entire national research study. Now, one day we hope to do this uh, internationally, globally, uh, but right now I think these statistics are still very interesting, although they're very much based on the American population. Uh, but we hired an independent research firm, the Center for Generational Kinetics based in Austin, Texas, to go out and, and yield a national research study to help us and help you better understand the impacts and the role of personal branding as we head into this next uh, generation, uh, Gen Z that's pop up, popping up in the workforce to the uh, slow exit of the baby boomers from the workforce. And what does that look like when it comes to how important is a personal brand? And what is a personal brand, right? So these are just some of the uh, statistics of how we uh, fielded this study. Uh, just to kind of give you some uh, information, it's uh, statistically valid uh, to the 3% uh, degree. And one of the things that we wanted to just really go out is just get some general information. And when it comes to building a personal brand and in, in our world, an influential personal brand. And so I'm going to share some of that with you today. And you are some of the first people to actually get this information because this is brand new. We only released this data uh, less than one week ago. So truly, you will be getting this even before many of our clients even get this information. Um, and this really should help uh, poise the conversation around what is a personal brand? Do I need one? And how do I build one? So here's just some high level, uh, I would say, uh, interesting findings uh, when it comes to building a personal brand. And here are the three things that I really want to focus on and highlight first. So if we can, let me get my PowerPoint there working. Uh, the first thing is that personal branding is the future. Like it truly is the future when we come to trust and marketability in the marketplace. It is the future. The second thing is that it is highly profitable, right? Americans, for this study, are actually willing to spend more, significantly more, on products and services that are represented by someone with an established personal brand. And then the third thing that we're going to talk a little bit about today is how a personal brand is actually a trust accelerator, that truly... A personal brand, someone who has an established personal brand that other people know about and can follow, accelerates their, their customers' willingness to buy from them, trust them, promote them, engage with them, hire them, work for them, and buy from them. So it is the future. It is highly profitable. And it is a trust accelerator. In fact, uh, so much of a trust accelerator 
Uh, based on this national research study, uh, we found that three fourths, that's 74% of Americans are willing to trust someone who has an established personal brand. Now that's all Americans, but I do wanna call your attention to uh, older millennials because older millennials are actually willing 85% more to trust someone who has an established personal brand, which simply stated is someone that they know and trust, right? That is it. Now, on top of that, Americans are more likely to buy from, recommend, and do business with an individual who has an established personal brand. And look at these statistics. Right, 63% are willing to buy from someone who has an established personal brand versus someone who does not. 57% are willing to recommend them more than someone who does not. And 55% are more likely to do business with them versus someone who does not have an established personal brand. Now, there's also some other interesting data points on this slide that I do want to call your attention to, um, is that uh, almost a third of Americans who participated in this national research study said that they are more interested and more likely to seek a romantic relationship with someone who has a personal brand and to date them. So in addition to growing our business, we can also be growing our love lives <laughs> with the power of personal branding. But this, this speaks volumes about where we're headed in terms of how important is it that the individual that represents a company and the individual themselves. Doesn't matter if you are an author, speaker, course creator, doesn't matter if you're a, a stay at home mom or a CEO. The power of an established personal brand is becoming more important and more prevalent every single day. In fact, I think this is very telling because the millennial generation, and you can see here that younger millennials are 26 to 34, whereas the older millennials are aged 35 to 44. But the millennial generation now has the most spending power in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world. And what we are finding is that this older millennial generation, these people 35 to 44, are the most likely generation to engage with someone who has an established personal brand. But across the board, if you look at all of the statistics, um, they are all, all more than 50% except for uh, the baby boomer generation, but they're right on the cusp. They're right on the cusp. But this is very, very important when you think about who is your audience, right? Who is your audience? Who buys from you? Who listens to you? Who engages with you? Who promotes you? And what demographic do they fall in? Because what we're finding is that 76% of older millennials are more likely to buy from someone who has an established personal brand versus someone who does not. Now, the reason this data is so important for this conversation is it literally positions ourselves in the ability of going, okay, well, if we're finding that personal branding truly is the future of marketing, well, what do I need to do to build a personal brand? And really, what is a personal brand? And so we have a, a soft definition of this uh, that, uh, and not in an effort to uh, oversimplify anything, is what we believe to be true. And what we believe a personal brand is, is a personal brand is simply what people think about when they think of you. That's it. A personal brand is simply what people think about when they think about you. Another word for that is reputation. Is a personal brand is nothing other than the monetization and digitization of your reputation. And here's why these statistics were astounding and not so astounding at the same time, is that we all have a reputation. Some personal branding is more intentional and more focused to, towards building that external outward facing reputation where for the rest of us, it's a little bit more reactive and it evolves and is established on its own. Whereas in personal branding, it's just the intentional effort to monetize and digitize the reputation that you want to be known for. 
We can be proactive or reactive about it. And to us, the proactive approach is personal branding. And so I thought um, this would be a really good uh, interactive part of my presentation is to actually run a couple of tests around people uh, that have well-established personal brands and well-established uh, reputations, but did so long before this concept and business of personal branding. So here's the first one. Um, and I'll just ask you to put this in the chat. If you know who this is, just put it in the chat to prove a small point here. Um, so if you know who this is, just stick it in the chat. Right, so I didn't have to talk about this individual. I don't have to share her accolades or her history for most of you to recognize this is Mother Teresa, who has a widely notated positive reputation, right? Uh, long before uh, social media or the digital age, uh, she already had a well-standing personal brand and reputation, right? Now, there's another person on this slide who you also, I would assume, should recognize. So same thing, do me a quick favor. If you recognize this next individual, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. I would imagine most of you also recognize this person. This is Adolf Hitler. Now, here's the fascinating thing uh, that we have found about reputation and personal branding is it doesn't matter per se how positive or negative one is in order to have one, right? So these are two counterposing ideas here of individuals with Mother Teresa, who predominantly has a very positive uh, reputation and a very positive uh, message, whereas in Adolf Hitler could not be the more polar opposite. However, that does not make him any less well known for much more horrific concepts, but he still has a reputation. He still has a personal brand, just not one that we would want to mimic, right? So one of the things that we had found through all of this research and through all of this comparison, uh, truly over the last 20 years, is that there, there's a formula for building a reputation. There's a formula that you and I can follow today to build a personal brand. Um, and it's very simply stated, is that your results times your reach equals your reputation. So your results are the things that you've accomplished, the things that you've done, right? This could be anything from having children to building billion dollar businesses. It can be taking care of the poor and the orphaned to leading a genocide, right? Uh, those are results. They can be very positive or very negative. But if you take that result and you multiply at times how many people know about it, your reach, therein lies your reputation, right? So the question then remains, well, which one is more impactful today? Is it the results that you have or is it the reach that you have? Is it the amazing content and message and products and services? Or is it how many people know about those amazing pieces of information, products, and services. So here's the second uh, interactive part of my presentation today. I run a little quiz here. Um, so I would like you to do again, just a couple more times, entertain me, please. Uh, if you know who this individual is, put it in the chat. Uh, this is also timely as the uh, Olympics are not too far away, uh, but this is Michael Phelps, right? Uh, this is Michael Phelps. He is the all-time most winning gold medalist in history. Not U.S. history, uh, not uh, any certain country, just history. In the Olympics, in the history of the Olympics, he is the most gold winning medal athlete of all time with 23 gold medals. Now, Equal to that, uh, I want you to just one more time, I promise, one more time. Um, if you know who this next person is, please put their name in the chat, okay? So if you know who this is, go ahead and put it in the chat. See some guesses. Okay. Me, <laughs> so I see one person. Uh, a couple of people, my future best friend. <laughs> this is Jenny Thompson, okay? Uh, now, here, here's the thing that I think is so fascinating about this, is that Jenny Thompson is the equivalent to Michael Phelps for females. She is the female most gold-winning medalist 
of Olympic history. They just both happen to be uh, both from swimming, right? That just happens to share the same sport. However, I would bet the majority, the majority of you who follow the Olympics uh, would know who Michael Phelps is. I would bet that. He's a spokesperson in many places. He's had lots of media coverage for a variety of things. We'll not talk about that. Uh, but he's an incredibly talented athlete. Jenny Thompson is equally incredibly talented. So why is it that Michael Phelps is so much more well known in the Olympic world, in the world of swimming, than perhaps Jenny Thompson to the general public? So it poses that question again. What is more important today, more impactful today? Is it truly results or is it reach? Because I would say, when you're speaking of the two, the results quite are quite similar. Their reach, however, is significantly different in terms of general population awareness. And so what we have found is that for most of us, right, a lack of revenue is not our biggest problem. Not in business, uh, not as entrepreneurs, not in the world of personal branding. Revenue is not the biggest problem. A lack of reputation tends to be the bigger problem that we, send, we see today. Uh, the worst thing in the world, in my opinion, is to be the world's best kept secret, right? You do wonderful things. You have wonderful offerings. You do incredible work. And yet just not enough people know about it. It is not a lack of revenue that is the problem. It is a lack of awareness. It is a lack of marketability. It is a lack of reputation that we find most are struggling with today. And here's why that is so important. Um, findings from our recent study says that 58% of Americans would be willing to pay more, pay more to receive services from a professional who does not work at a large company, but instead has an established personal brand. Y'all, that's crazy, right? Look at these numbers, 68% of Gen Z, 63 of younger millennials, 62% of older millennials, 58 in the general population say, no, I will spend more money to buy and work with an individual who has a personal brand versus someone who does not work at a large company. But it is the person that they are going after. Yeah, this is mind blowing. This is significant. This is the turn in a very long standing cor uh, corporate history of people defer to companies and to corporations. And now we're saying, no, it's actually, I would much rather work with the individual that I have come to know, trust and resonate with versus a company, versus someone who works at a company. It is about the person, not the company. Reputation precedes revenue. People need to know you. They need to see you. They need to be able to trust you, not just a corporate entity. Because the truth is, if people don't know about you, they simply cannot do business with you. They cannot follow you. They cannot buy from you. They cannot promote you. They cannot engage with you. They cannot recommend you. If they don't know about you, they cannot do business with you. So that leads us to, well, then how do we get known? <laughs> and what do we want to be known for? which is the essence of a personal brand. So how do you separate yourself from the crowd when everyone tends to be jumping on the ship? Now, this is simple, but simple does not always mean easy. Uh, most definitely not, as many of us know. However, there are a few things that we should preface um, as we get into this conversation of personal branding. And there's a concept that uh, we teach at Brain Builders Group, which is our company called She Hands Wall. And here's, all, and here's how I want to simply explain this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but there's a wall down the middle. That's what we call she hands wall. And on the left side of that wall is the category of the unknown, right? Uh, that means that you are involved in too many topics, too many products, too many profiles, too many business models, too many jobs, and you have too many ideas to be known for one thing. So you remain in this category of the unknown. Now that could be unknown in your local area, in your region, in your country. It could be internationally. It could be uh, unknown in your industry. It could be unknown to your competitors, whatever that is. But there is a place where many of us sit where we aren't quite yet known in the marketplace. 
And the question we're really trying to answer is, well, how do we go from being unknown to being known for our product, for our service in our industry and in our region and our country and the world? How do we go from the unknown to the new, to the, to the known? The challenge with that is that oftentimes there's just too much commoditization and not enough uniqueness. There is not enough harnessing of the natural uniqueness of who you are, not what you do, to break through that wall from the unknown to the known. Because we believe that there is one common factor that all of us uh, have the opportunity to do to break through that wall, and it's to become known for one thing. Not 10 things, one thing. So how do we become known for simply one thing? And I can give you dozens of corporate examples or individual examples for this. I think the largest one to share is Amazon, right? Amazon is the beast. They're the elephant in the marketplace. And uh, if you guys just take it back like 20 years, Amazon actually started by doing one thing. What was it? Now, today they sell all the things. But in the beginning, when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, they sold one thing, books. They became known for selling one thing, and they became the best at it, and the most well-known for it, and the most popular for it. And then they grew and expanded and grew some more and expanded some more. And today, there isn't anything they don't sell. Right? But it started with one thing. And, uh, and the words of a good friend of ours, Larry Winget, and I love the way he says this. He says, you have to find your uniqueness and then learn to exploit it in the service of others. And we could give you dozens of examples with this. You could go anywhere from Apple to Google to Facebook to Amazon to Tesla. Uh, but it is start with one thing. Get known for one thing, then expand into many things. But it all starts with one thing. And it really starts with one question. So I'm gonna share this question with you. This is the thing that we believe is the standing out moment, the standing out point of finding, establishing, developing, and growing your personal brand. And is simply being able to answer this one question, which is what problem do you solve? What problem, that's not plural, that's singular, what problem do you solve? What problem does your business solve? What problem does your content solve? The number one secret to building a best-selling, well-known, established personal brand is simply knowing the answer to this question, which is what problem do you solve? Because what people really buy are solutions to problems, right? And if you aren't crystal clear, crystal freaking clear on what problem you solve, there is no way your customers will be clear on it. People are way more likely to spend money to solve a problem than anything else. So what problem do you solve? And are you clear enough? And can you articulate it clear enough that your audience can clearly identify you with the problem that you solve. So I'll give you some uh, quick examples of what I mean by this. Um, some of you will probably recognize Brene Brown. Uh, Brene Brown is known for solving the problem of shame, right? Uh, Dave Ramsey, uh, he is known for solving the problem of debt. Uh, Simon Sinek, he is known for solving the problem of having no purpose, as a lack of purpose. Uh, Lewis Howes, a, a top 50 podcaster worldwide, is known for solving the problem of self-doubt. They have associated themselves to one problem that their life's mission now, their company's mission, their revenue mission, is to solve this problem for their audience. And even way before personal branding was personal branding, it was still happening, right? Mother Teresa was synonymous with helping people overcome poverty. Right? Martin Luther King Jr., synonymous with trying to solve the problems of inequality. These were problems that were the foundation of these individuals' reputation, their personal brand, their content, their message, and what they were meant to do. What you really have to do today to have a best-selling personal brand is to become an ambassador of the problem that you feel like you were called to solve in this world. Because we have to solve or sell the problem as much as we sell the solution. 
right? Uh, it's not just solutions. Uh, people don't want to just buy butterflies and rainbows, right? Although that's really fun. Uh, but they need to know that whatever I'm investing in is going to solve a problem that I have, right? Technical, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, whatever it is. So here's the question that you have. This is your one homework assignment from our time together is answer this question in one word. What problem do you solve? And one word, not a phrase, not a statement, not multiple problems. This is one problem and one word. What is the problem that you solve? Now, one of the things that I offered um, to uh, everyone at A Small World, everyone who's attending this webinar today, is that if you want help answering that question, uh, please go to freebrandcall.com forward slash AJ. Um, you can see it right on the screen there. Um, and you can go there, uh, you can request a free call with someone from our team to go through this with you. Uh, we have free video courses, we have free webinars, we have dozens of free downloads on our website. Uh, but if you're going, okay, this, this has piqued my curiosity and I, I want to know more. What do I need to do here? How do I answer this question? Uh, this is a site you can go to freebrandcall.com forward slash AJ to get additional resources or even request a free call. Uh, with one of the strategists in our team to start working through this process, right? But this isn't the only question you have to answer. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through all of these, uh, but just as much as you want to be able to answer, what problem do I solve? You simultaneously want to be able to also answer the question, well, what am I passionate about solving, right? There are many things that I could solve that I don't really have passion for. I'm quite good at Excel. I can solve a lot of Excel problems. I'm not really passionate uh, teaching other people how to solve their Excel problems, right? Something I could do, but not something I'm passionate about doing. So it's the, it's the juxtaposition of learning. What problem do you solve also paired with the answers to all of these remaining questions? Well, what do I spend time researching? What would people be willing to buy from me? What business am I in? What results do I have? Uh, what am I passionate about? Because like, there's two sides of this. It's what you could do and what you want to do. It's what you could talk about versus what you want to talk about. And there is an audience for anything. But you've got to be able to define that audience by first asking, what problem do I solve? And once you know that, you'll be able to figure out what audience you solve it for. Because the second thing that we have to figure out uh, if we're interested in building an influential personal brand is, well, how do I create more trust with my audience the people I want to serve in less time. And here's the thing about today. Uh, you cannot differentiate yourself just based on knowledge. There's just too much information out there. Uh, people do not even buy information anymore, right? There's just too much out there for free. So don't try to differentiate yourself based on uh, degrees and certifications. Um, that's not enough. It's like you've got to differentiate yourself based on trust. It's the quickest way to go from the unknown to the known with the audience that you want to serve. It's not about differentiating yourself on what you do. It's no longer about what you do. Personal branding is about differentiating yourself based on who you are as a human being, as a person. It's not about your title or your position. It's what you believe in. It's the problems you solve and who you solve them for, right? Going back to this again as a brand is what people think about when they think of you which means your reputation is really just an assessment of your trustworthiness, right? Uh, in fact, it's not just a, a small assessment, it's a quite large assessment. Because based on our study that we just conducted, 82% of Americans agree that companies are far more influential if the founder or executives have a personal brand that they know about, trust, and follow. Not a little bit, a lot of it, 82% agree that companies are more influential if they know and trust and can follow the founders, the face, the people behind the company. But look at this with older millennials, 88%, 88%. And here's the truth, right? People do not do business with companies or services or knowledge, or expertise, or products, right? People do business with people, with you. 
That is why personal branding has taken such a stronghold in the marketplace. That's why these online influencers and digital personalities um, are getting more brand deals than even professional athletes and celebrities. It's why Victoria's Secret is doing one of the largest corporate rebrands in global history, right? Because they know that people do business with people, not logos, not services, not knowledge, not brands, but they do business with people. And in fact, here in the United States, two thirds, two thirds of Americans would be willing to spend more money, more money on products and services from the companies of founders whose personal brand aligns with their own personal values. And 80% of older, older millennials say the same, not two thirds, but 80%. And I'll, I'll give you a, a quick personal example. Um, and we're going to break for just in, in just a minute to do some questions. But uh, this is my own testament of that. I happen to fall in this older millennial category. I'm 37 years old. I'll be 38 just next month. And when we got this study back, these were our assumptions. These were our hopes. This is what we were intending to find, but we weren't sure, which is why we yielded the study. But I also know this to be true for myself. And uh, I, I do a lot of yoga, do a lot of Pilates, I do a lot of bar class. And here's the thing uh, that I found true, that there are two very prominent brands, um, <laughs> at least here, uh, that uh, are most well known for yoga attire. There's plenty others, but these are two. These are kind of like the, the beasts in the market. You have Lululemon and Athleta relatively the same price, which is too pricey, um, is what that is really, uh, but relatively the same price, relatively similar products, right? Uh, similar styles, similar designs, similar target markets. However, uh, for me personally, I choose to purchase ridiculously too much money for yoga pants from Athleta versus Lululemon. Now that's not necessarily because I think that Athleta has a superior product, I often find myself liking some of Lululemon's uh, design prints and styles much more. But I still choose to put my money towards Athleta because I much more resonate with their female CEO than the male CEO of Lululemon. Not just because I'm a woman and I'm trying to uh, promote other women-led <laughs> businesses, but it's because Athleta is a sustainable company. They're supporting underprivileged women all over the world. Um, it's because they're eco-friendly and their products are wholly sustainable. I align more with the values and the principles and the mission that their CEO talks about more so than I do with the one of Lululemon. It is not about the company. It is not about the products. It's I want to support a company whose founder, whose CEO, I more align with. So thus, I will spend more money than I would for just going somewhere else. Because in order to build trust in companies or people, we need to be able to see you, know you, and also learn from you. And this is something I thought was fascinating from this recent study, um, is one of the easiest, quickest, fastest things that you can do that costs almost zero dollars to help your audience build trust in you by seeing you, knowing you, and learning from you. And to me, this is mind blowing. This is blue, blue, the lid off of our study is that the number one thing, the number one thing that people said was most important when deciding, when factoring who to pay for products and services from, when they were deciding on who to hire, who to purchase from, testimonials about the individual or their products or services was the number one most important factor when it came to determining who they were going to go with. Y'all, that is crazy talk, right? Look at this. Like it was testimonials about their work. Then it was they are paid to consult or advise on this topic, or they were paid to speak on their topic. Let me tell you what's, what was not in the top three, a best-selling book, a New York Times best-selling book. Uh, it was not a blog. It was not a YouTube series. It was not uh, millions of followers on social media. It was not tons of engagement on social media. It was not even appearing in the media all the time. But it was, what do other people say about your products and services or about you? It's a trust accelerator. And it costs you nothing to ask your clients, to ask your customers, to ask your employees, 
to give you testimonials about you, your company, your products, and your services. The number one thing that people said was the important factor when deciding who to buy from. Now look at, but look at who was at the bottom. I thought this was fascinating. At the very bottom was they had given a TED talk or they have a podcast, least important when making these decisions, right? And then right in the middle there was publishing, right? I naively thought that this would be at the very top of the list. I'd be, okay, well, most important is, you know, do they have a New York Times bestselling book? Do they have a, a, you know, flying speaking career? Do they have a top rated podcast? Nope, 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 none of those things. In fact, having a book was 10 on the list and it did not even matter if it was a self-published, traditionally published or a New York Times bestselling book. They all weighted just about the same. But testimonials were of 62% of people said this was the most important thing. 22 more percent than having a New York Times bestselling book. That must blow your mind. And if not, I did not do a good job of presenting that data because this is truly the future of where we're going. It is the trust accelerator. It is the differentiation point of who we are and where we're going in this marketplace. That is a huge part of making sure that as we're building our reputation and our personal brand, it's done with uh, intention. It's truly done with intention because today it is not any longer about how much you teach, right? It's not about knowledge. It's not about content. Uh, what we have found is that for most part today, it's like people are no longer paying for information. They are paying for application. Right? You can get information everywhere, all the time, 24 hours a day from every platform out there. They are not paying for information. They are paying for application, which is why businesses exist. And so building a business is truly not nearly as valuable as building a reputation in today's marketplace. And it is no longer just about focusing on converting customers. It is about creating fans raving fans who know you, resonate with you, trust you, will promote you, engage with you because they align with you as an individual, not as a company. And ultimately, it really comes down to, it's not just about making money, it's about making a difference. Because building a personal brand is about impact while money is the byproduct of that impact. The money will come if the mission is there. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'm going to open this up for some Q&A um, to see what questions, if any, um, you guys have. And so this is our opportunity to just open up uh, the Q&A. We've got probably 10 minutes for Q&A. And so I will see if, you, if anyone has any questions. There is uh, the Q&A, but you can also just put them in the chat. All right, so I've got one. All right, well, we'll cover as many of these um, as we can in the, in the 10 minutes or so we have. Uh, on the importance of testimonials, if this is based on survey response, isn't there a possibility that what they say is important, but may be different from what they really think is important? So uh, this is based on our survey responses, right? It was statistically valid to the 1,000th percent person, but is there a possibility that what they say is important may be different from what they really think is important? Uh, very, very likely, right? And I think uh, here's my opinion is that the value of a testimonial, uh, the importance of it very much comes down to what is the intention of the questions, right? And here's the, one of the biggest mistakes that I see individuals and companies make with getting testimonials. They say, will you just tell me what you think? That's bad. Don't do that. You need to have intentional questions to get intentional responses. So uh, our philosophy at Brand Builders Group is we interview all of our clients. If we want to collect a testimonial, we interview them because it's like we know that they won't necessarily know it off the top of their head. And it's through the in-depth conversation. That's not to be long. It's five minutes. We have a five minute uh, intentional question survey that we walk people through to get a five minute testimonial. And then we break those up and we use them, Right. But I think a big part of it is like, yes, many times they're confused or misconstrued because we leave it open-ended of, hey, will you just write me a testimonial for what it was like to work with me? That's misleading for a lot of us. So don't do that, right? Actually say, hey, would you answer these five questions or these three questions? Or, hey, would you mind if we just do a quick conversation and I'll record it? Can I interview you? 
So you can get to the real heart of what is it that you're trying to glean? And then how do you pull that out of the individual to figure out what parts make most sense for you? That's my take on it. Uh, but I think poor testimonials come from poor questions. Um, I think great ones come from great questions. So I think it has a lot to do with the power of the question to get the power of uh, the testimonial. But yes, if you don't do it that way, it's, it could be very, very, they say one thing, but really meant another and it didn't come across. Totally, totally agree with that. So, um, all right. So what would your personal branding advice be for a freelance brand designer? Okay, that is a very broad question and I could give you 1,301 answers to that. Um, but it would be the same exact advice I would give anyone. And it would be start at the same place that we tell everyone to start. Every single client that we work with, every prospect that we engage with, it does not matter to us if you are a Hollywood A-list actor or you are a mommy blogger who is coming out uh, back into the workforce again. We would say the number one thing that you have to do first and foremost before anything else is figure out what problem you solve, what unique way do you solve it, who do you solve it for, and how do you want to make money solving it? Let me say that again. Find out what problem you solve, what unique way do you solve it, i.e. your message, who do you solve it for, i.e. your audience, and how do you want to make money solving it, i.e. your business model. Those are the four things that you must find out for a freelance brand designer or anybody else. Uh, and that is the foundation of what our entire business is built on at Brand Builders Group. Um, that's where all of the strategy begins, way before the aesthetics and the copy and the technology. It, it comes down to the strategy, which is what problem do you solve? How do you solve it? Who do you solve it for? And how do you want to make money solving it? Okay. Um, okay. Do you feel like a personal brand should be established around your own name or should you simply be the face of the brand? All right, that's a great question, and I love this question, and I also i am going to answer it because it's so close to myself and my husband and our company. So um, I have a personal brand, right? My name is AJ Vaden. It is my personal brand is around my name, my face, my beliefs, my values, my message. However, my primary business model is our company. I am not the face of our company. Um, my husband and I are equal 50, 50 business partners. He's got a face, I've got a face. Um, but this is a part that kind of can get convoluted. It's like our personal brand is meant to attract a personal audience of people who have like-minded values and beliefs that I do, who are naturally attracted to my content, my style, my personality, because it's aligned with who they are. I will not be a fit for all. I'm okay with that. I'm fully aware of that. However, my business model is our company, Brain Builders Group, in which I am not the face of. Same for my husband. So my husband, Rory Vaden, is a New York Times bestselling author. Um, he's a Hall of Fame speaker. Uh, he's very well known in that space. His personal brand is his name, his face, his primary business model is our company. We are not the face of the company. We are the face of our personal brand. So to answer that, yes, I do feel like your personal brand is about you. It is your face. It is your name. It is your message. But that doesn't mean that's what your business is about. Right. Um, so I think those are those are two unique things just because those are resonate with who we are. It's like we have two very different established personal brands in which we are independent faces of with our names that both drive to a similar business model, which is our company, which we are not the face of. We are just the founders of and the executives of. But our personal brands are us innately. OK, um, what? Uh, OK, I'm going to come over here from the chat. Uh, I'm going to try to like bounce between the Q&A and the chat because we have just a couple of more minutes. And thank you so much for all these great questions. Um, OK, um, can a person have more than one brand and can we be known in more than one thing? Yes and yes, but in what order? OK, um, this kind of goes back to our philosophy of she hands wall. It's like if you really want to become known, like really known. It needs to be for one thing. It's the quickest, fastest way to break through what we call Sheehan's wall is to go from that no one knows about me to now people know about me. And I'm not saying in a household name kind of structure, but yes, you know, go back to the Amazon example with uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon or Tesla with Elon Musk uh, or Steve Jobs and Apple. Um, but then you can talk about actual individual personal brands. So one of the ones that I love to talk about all the time is The Rock, right? Dwayne Johnson. I'm a super fan. 
think he's so cool. I think he's doing all this awesome stuff. Today, he's doing all this awesome stuff. That is not how Dwayne The Rock Johnson started. He became known for one thing and one thing alone, and that was WWE wrestling. So let's take it back a minute and remember all the people before they were who we know they are today. He became known as a WWE wrestler, then broke into Hollywood, then broke into TV shows. Now he's got his tequila thing going. He's like one of the highest paid uh, actors in the whole world, right? But that, it didn't start that way. He didn't have TV shows and game shows and didn't have tequila brands. No, he had a wrestling career. It was one thing. I can go to Ellen DeGeneres. I can go to Oprah Winfrey. I can give you hundreds of examples if we have the time. One thing. So yes, over time, it can be many things and you can have many brands. And in fact, I think one of the things that we have found is that often uh, our brand changes. It's not that you have 10 brands at the same time, it's your brand changes. Why does it change? Because you change. This is about an individual, right? Uh, thank the Lord, I am not who I was when I was 21 today. My brand, who I would have been at 21, is very different as a married uh, CEO with two young children at 37. My brand has changed, it's reinvented, it's evolved. Uh, that will happen for all of us. I don't find it common that you will have opposing brands all at the same time, but your brand will evolve as you do as a human being. That's just the innate of your own personal growth and interest over time. Um, you see that all over, all over the place. Um, okay, one last question. Uh, one last question. So I'm going to go with, okay, I'm going to go with the last one that I see here just to make it easy. So there's, there's a lot here. Um, what if the CEO is not so charismatic and not so skilled in social media. Um, there's, there's a workaround for anything. Here's what I would say to that. Um, and the individual does not have to be skilled in social media. And here's the thing I think is really important. I didn't have time for in my presentation today is that social media is not something that the individual must be skilled in. There are thousands, if not millions of companies and individuals who can run your social media brilliantly. What you need to be in control of is the message and the content. The brand, the individual, the person, that's what I'm talking about, has one main job, create the content. Everything else should be delegated, outsourced, insourced, whatever you want to do with it. You do not have to be a master of social media to be a master of social media. The individual personal brand, the only thing that has to come from them is the content. It's the message because that has to be true to you. Um, I'm not a promoter of like outsource your content, outsource your message, because then you're outsourcing your voice. Then what's the point of doing this all together? Okay. But the rest of it can be delegated, outsourced. Um, somebody else can do it. They don't have to be so skilled in that. And if they're not charismatic, um, there is training for that. Right. There, those are skills that you can develop, even though you may not think you can. It's like there are ways of getting around it. Um, we have plenty of people in our own company, and we're a personal branding company that are not awesome on video. So we don't just put them on video by themselves. We interview them because then the pressure is off. It's not about memorizing content, but in an interview format, their charisma, it unfolds, right? Their personality and what they're passionate about, it just starts to bubble up to the top. You put them in front of a camera by themselves, and it's like blank stares, deer in headlights. Who are you? Where did, where did you go? Right. And so a part of it is it's learning how to bring out the charisma that everyone possesses in some unique way. But it's also about uh, serving the audience that they're meant to serve. Right. I, I so often we work with uh, tons of CEOs and executives and entrepreneurs, um, and a lot of them are in the somehow connected to the financial sector, banking, you know, whatever. And I, I'm not going to generalize this, but that does, those don't tend to be industries where there's lots of personality and uh, lots of fun and humor, whatever, you know. Uh, and one of the things I have just found is like, well, don't leave it to their own devices. It's like that's it's our job as the support staff or the company or the, you know, the outsourced firm to pull that out of them in a way that sets them in a unique setting for their unique audience. And again, that goes back to this is why it's so important of not just figuring out what problem you solve but, but, and the unique message, but who do you solve it for? And perhaps their audience is just full of people who also don't care about charisma, and that's okay. But that's why we have to find it and tailor it and serve that 
audience. So um, I know we have gone a few minutes over and I thank you guys for sticking with me. There were so many uh, wonderful questions, um, but we have gone over our allotted time. I apologize for that, uh, but you guys had uh, such great questions. I so appreciate you. And I do believe um, if I'm not mistaken, that it is my job to release you back into the wild. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Um, have a wonderful evening or day, wherever you may be. Thank you guys so much.